Okay, and thank you guys for being here too. I think especially after this last year, I almost think these these programs are in addition addition to being educational, they're almost therapeutic. I mean, just from having been allowed around out so long and not being able to get out. So I just kind of love it seeing all you guys getting back together and rubbing heads and you know, little love you little buddies, you know. And I think we get a lot of value. And especially you gotta commend the MD Expo staff to put these programs on. They've just been doing a fantastic job really getting us all together in a really valuable, helpful, helpful way. So I hope when you come out of here, uh, at the end of the day, the end of the program, you're kind of in your professional baggage are getting recharged, a little bit more buoyant and balanced, and kind of just get revalidated on the importance of what we're all about and what we've been trying to do all these years. So what I want to essentially uh, do is probably going to be approaching the blasphemous in a way, because I want to take on a sacred cow of leakage current measurements that we've been literally and diligently doing for over 50 years. Literally over 50 years. And if you've ever wondered, back in my early days, I was out there diligently doing this stuff, right? Those leakage currents out. And then gradually I started asking, what are they doing this for? Especially when all of you probably, you know, what, 95 plus times you do a current measure, leakage current measurement, there's no change, there's nothing wrong. It's we still keep doing them and doing them and doing them. And so I want to um, partly, and I guess, challenge you is you can at least temporarily try to decouple electrical safety from leakage current measurements. It has become so inextricably connected together, it may be impossible to do, but just temporarily just try to suspend, separate the two. And what I hope to leave you with by the time we get done here is that we don't need to see this anymore. That's the blasphemy. But uh, by the time we get done, hopefully uh, we'll make, a, make some believers out of you. But in order to get there, what we have to do, we've got to go back to school a little bit. We have to review some of your fundamental AC circuit principles, some of the stuff that you know you probably are going to gag on. Some of it you may have down, you may may know really well. Uh, and so some of the stuff is redundant and not new for you. Just kind of bear with me if you can a little bit. Uh, but we got to get through some of that first because that's the foundation justification for the ultimate conclusion that we're going to try to make. We'll touch a little bit on some of the um, actual physiological effects and how some of this this goofy stuff got started. And even though it's beyond a little bit beyond Ralph Bader, actually, there were some guys a few years ahead of him that started this whole pants. Okay. The other, the other thing in reviewing some of the CC stuff, one of the benefits of this um, material, if you can remember from your education, is that this stuff hasn't changed. You know, unlike Python or C++ or Java software that mutates every six months, these AC fundamental circuit principles are in stone. They have not changed. They're not going anywhere. So once you get a command of them, you kind of got it for life. And we have all of this get started a few hundred years ago with Michael Faraday, who came up with this relationship. And all of these little founding father things we'll see here, they're just, I don't know how they came up with these, these little insights of brilliance at the time. But this basic relationship basically tells us that the, we can induce a voltage in a coil of wire, the number of turns is simply n, and this DPDT thing here, that simply refers to a change in magnetic flux, relative change. So we can have a stationary magnet with a rotating coil. We can have a, a, a um, stationary coil with a rotating bag. As long as there's relative change of a flux with a two through a coil of wire, we can get a voltage across that coil. Okay. That's the fundamental on how So typically we're changing polarities with that rotating rotating And again, some of the stuff you guys had, I know way back when, but we just kind of go through it fundamentally. And it's literally the speed of that rotating coil, which is ultimately, we'll see, dictated at the power plants, that determines the, both the frequency, the frequency of this alternating signal. It has a peak value and a period associated with it. And that period is related also, again, ultimately to the speed of the turn at the power plants, which is regulated very, 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 very tightly to give us our uh, 60 hertz frequency that we have. Omega here is just uh, the gearhead mechanical engineering term for describing the rotating of mechanical term. 
so that the period of that wave form uh, is given by one over the reciprocal of the frequency. So that period time for one complete cycle about 16 milliseconds. All of this stuff, little by little by little, we'll see it's going to explain where the leakage currents come from and what they're really ultimately all about. Can you guys remember using oscilloscope? I don't think we use them anymore, right? Maybe back in the day uh, we did, and uh, but these are incredibly valuable instruments that allows us to literally measure both amplitude as well as frequency information of any signal that we want to uh, inject into the scope. So if we had a setting here, for example, of uh, uh, 0.1 volt for, for vertical division, horizontal sensitivity, 50 microseconds per division, okay, we can measure both the period of that waveform as well as its amplitude. Very, very useful tool to characterize signals like that. And if you remember from way back, mathematically, we could do the same thing. Well, we got a sine function in here. Uh, and if you ever wanted to find the instantaneous value of the sine, the voltage, which you want to do all the time, but we don't, we don't, we don't do set crap. You know, but that's fundamentally, mathematically, what describes that sine wave. So again, we don't think like that, we don't talk like that, but what we do think about and talk about are the RMS values of our alternating waveform. It's a shorthand method. Uh, all, it, all it gives us, however, is amplitude information. It doesn't tell us anything about the frequency, but if the frequency is not going anywhere, we don't need that information generally. But it's RMS, root mean squared, and it's also referred to as the effective value because the RMS value of a sine wave or any alternating waveform is that value of AC that produces the same heating effect as an equivalent amount of DC. So if we had a water bath here, for example, just a heating element in it, and we put in 120 volts RMS, which is the nominal voltage from our wall element, AC, our multimeter is also displayed RMS values when you're measuring AC. If we put 120 volts into the water bath, if we use 120 volts of DC, we heat the water up the same amount. So it's the effectively the same heating effect as DC. You can also think of the RMS value as essentially a DC value sense. Is that coming back kind of a little bit? Okay. You can convert from peak values to RMS and RMS back to peak if you should need to for whatever reason. Um, but the RMS value will always be less than peak value. And our leakage current measurements from our analyzers, I, I don't like to call them safety analyzers, that's what we call them, but the analyzers, what you're measuring is RMS microamperes. This is another the mathematical way of describing our RMS value. 120 RMS is 170 sine 377. 377 is radians. So 377 divided by 2 pi gives us 60 hertz. So this, this is a complete expression for that waveform, and 170 is the peak. Where that might become even maybe remotely a, a value if you had to replace filter capacitors, uh, diodes, and circuits. Remember, remember, diodes and caps, they have working voltages associated with them. Capacitors have a, a peak uh, working voltage DC value. Uh, you don't want to exceed that. Same thing with diodes. They have a peak inverse or peak inverse value you do not want to exceed. And in that regard, knowing that peak value that those components might be exposed to is a, could, be, could be important. And this is how we get root mean square. Again, uh, we actually have integrated circuits, by the way. If you ever inside our multimeters, and you can just go to New York, New York, New York, or DigiKey, and you can buy the integrated circuit chips. You can put in a signal, alternating signal, and you get an RMS value out. And what's going on in those chips? We first square the waveform, which gets rid of the negative going component, and it flips the sine wave to look like a full wave rectified uh, signal. Then we take the mean. And then we take the square root of it to get us back to our original units. That's all our MS uh, is about. Have you ever seen any of the uh, the neurally controlled prosthetics that are out there, the arms and limbs that are out there that are, that are controlled by either, are 
EMG, the, the muscle act, the electrical muscle activity off of our body. And those motors, and those artificial neural controlled lift prosthetics are driven by RMS signals from the EMG. We do an RMS conversion on the raw EMG, we get a DC signal that's pretty proportional to the force. All right, a little bit about how this electrical power comes into not only our, our hospitals, but our, our homes as well. You've probably seen some of these, maybe depending on where you're living, uh, the, the voltage is coming in through a transformer. You know, they call these pole pigs, it's like a big garbage can hanging on the pole. And typically in residential areas, that, that, that incoming voltage will be right around 14,000 volts. That's the top wire on the, on the pole there. And then that 14,000 is stepped down to typically 220 or 240 volts AC. Uh, there's a center tap seated in that transformer that allows us to get our 120 volt out. So here's where fundamentally these transformers work. Changing magnetic flux. This is an alternating magnetic flux. That gets coupled into a secondary flux that induces a voltage on the secondary. So we got Faraday's law essentially at play in the transformer. Very, the DPDD is changing in the flux. Okay. Remember some about your, your transformers. These are these are passive devices. Again, relatively simple. We've got them everywhere, obviously. And coils of wire on the primary side, number of turns. On the secondary side, number of turns. And it's the ratio of those turns of wire that determine whether the transformer is a step down whether it steps up, or in the case of isolated power, like some of our ORs we still have, if your cat has have isolated power, 120 in, you get 120 out. So the number of turns are the same. But the concept uh, is exactly the same. Current is coming in the primary, alternating. That sets up an alternating magnetic field. That's what this fee here. So it's going one way, it's going back. Ideally, the power in is equal to the power out, and power is current times voltage. Amps times volts gives us watts, the VA, volt amps. And um, ideally, what we put in, what we get out, but that never happens, of course. Uh, we get losses in the transform. And uh, what those losses are precisely what heats the transform up. So the wall warts, you know, you plug in, it feels a little bit warm. Uh, why it's warm is because there's three transformer losses that are in play. One of them are called copper losses, or I squared R losses, just simply due to this power being dissipated in the windings uh, is one. The other one is referred to as eddy, eddy current losses, because in this, as this magnetic flux is flowing, circulating through an iron core, it's also creating little voltages, circulating currents in the core. That's why if you ever look closely at a transformer, you'll see it's laminated. They're, they're, they're sheets of iron, but they've got like a varnish coating on it, insulating coating on it. And that coating is designed to try to minim, reduce some of those eddy currents. And then the third loss is called hysteresis. It's almost like a form of like magnetic friction, maybe. It's the, from the, the reversal of these little magnets, what so I'll call creates a little bit of a total loss. But all of those collectively uh, contribute to the warming up of your, the transformer. And, and frankly, the cheaper the transformers, the more undersized they are, the hotter they get. So if you ever have to replace some of these, design something new, um, the more you you can oversize it, the cooler it's going to be. Okay. This is, a, this is a crucial part here, a critical part of how the power comes into our residence. And it's similar in our, in our hospitals as well. Um, we've got the incoming power, high voltage in the transformer. We see it center tapped. So we have 220 or 240 on the two legs. And that's what we use to you know, run our baseboard heaters, air conditioners, dryers, stoves, things like that. And then the center tap for each leg is our 120. And each of those circuits are protected with either a fuse or a circuit breaker. 
and those are there to protect uh, really the insulation. You know, 15 or 20 amp breaker, uh, if we didn't have that in there, because power is equal to I squared R, the current squared times the resistance. Um, so if you had 20 amps, for example, uh, flowing through a tenth of an ohm, 20 squared is 400 times a tenth, 40 watts. It would be 40 watts just being dissipated in the wire. So of course, if that got too hot, then we got wire, you start fires, stuff like that. So we protect those uh, circuits with the fuse. But the key thing, again, this is electric code, national electric code uh, requirements. These are not up for debate. Okay? These are by, mandated by code that hot conductor, black, the ground, and the neutral is white. And the key thing here is right when the power comes into the facility, right into the entrance box, the neutral and the ground are mechanically, electrically bonded together. Key, 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 key concept. Neutral and ground only when the power comes in is bonded together uh, and connected uh, literally to the physical dirt, to the earth, we'll see. Um, one of the things I had made up a long time ago, I was in healthcare hospitals doing your stuff 22 years before I got back into academia and um, in, in three different uh, hospital systems around in, uh, Wisconsin and Omaha. And you know, doing started out doing a lot of technician repair maintenance kind of work. And one of the things I opened early on, I learned from somebody I don't even know where, uh, when we had, had every now and then you're running these funky intermittent kinds of problems, they couldn't figure out what was going on and uh, drive you kind of nuts. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it wasn't. And someone suggested checking the neutral ground voltage, just the voltage between neutral and ground, which theoretically should be zero, right? If you've got two pieces of wire bonded together, there shouldn't be any voltage across a piece of wire. Well, if you have some new construction, things get loosened up. You can, if you start getting voltages, you know, two volts or more, that can really create some havoc in some of our systems. So I just had a little uh, quick tail for my multimeter, just like plug it into the wall and I just measure that ground neutral AC voltage if there was any there, just to see. And every now and then you'd find something that was a little bit high and um, you never often didn't really know for sure, but that can create some, some havoc for you. Okay, that's the key. And again, neutral, and ground are bonded together. I didn't find this out until, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, the university I'm at is the Milwaukee School of Engineering. He was a student at that school in 1928 that invented the conventional free grounded outlet. I thought, holy shit, that's a kid, a student invented the damn thing. And I looked into a little bit more. Here was a, kind of the uh, urban legend was that his landlord's cat was getting a shock every time it backed into a box fan, I guess the landlord had in the apartment. And so the kid just, I don't know, intuitively psyched something out. Well, if I grounded that case of that metal fan, uh, cat won't get shot. Well, I can't imagine the kind of, you know, if he got a penny for each outlet, I don't know what, you know, how, what that again, it was kind of cool that a student came up with it. One of the things that we have been really diligent about, and it's a good thing, is we religiously also measure and hopefully not record anymore, but at least pass or fail kind of thing. The ground is the moment resistance between that ground pin and the case of the equipment. We check that continuity, right? You guys know the analyzers make it real easy to do. And so we've been real diligent about that, keeping it below a half an ohm, 150 more ohms or so. And uh, that's a good thing because it's again not uncommon. You can have loose screws in here, bad connections, and that, that ground can get a little, little flaky. What we haven't done. And I think we just tend to think, well, that's a facilities issue, is we, we, we never really give a lot of thought to what, what is the resistance, the only resistance between the pin and the socket of the outlet. You know, if you ever had a sloppy outlet, especially in our homes, uh, you know, when the pin is, in, the receptacle is not grabbing the plug very well, you can get some uh, high resistances in there. In fact, if it becomes too high, that's precisely what will make the plug more if you ever notice that, uh, you know, a toaster or a microwave or something that's high current demand to it, you feel a warm plug, there's a good chance you have power being dissipated between the sockets and the pin. And again, I squared up. So you got a 10 amp device, 400 watt device, a tenth of an ohm, 
10 amps squared is 100 times 0.1. You got 10 watts being dissipated just at the plug receptacle interface. It's warm. Same thing with the receptacle. See, if that ohmic resistance uh, gets too large, can be a problem. And the other thing we even pay less attention to is what is the resistance between that pin and the physical earth? You know, we, we have instruments and ways to test that, but I don't know anybody that does. If we just kind of assume that it's intact. But you can maybe appreciate that uh, the only way that this ground cord and the ground wire is going to be of any value is if this entire conductive pathway is intact. You get a, you get a high resistance pathway or an opening there somewhere, it doesn't matter how good our wine cord ground is if it's not connected to the physical dirt. These are typically eight foot or more copper rods buried into the physical dirt. This is right in your own homes, you have the same thing. It's often covered up, you can't see it anymore, but you can find and look, you'll see a, a, a bare, big stranded bare copper wire coming out going into that ground connection. So you don't want to cut that. None of you guys ever did that, right? But your dad's did you. I don't need that damn thing to cut that. Because of course, we get a ground all in, but you don't want to do that. So there's really two fundamental reasons for that ground wire, of course. One, if we had a worst case, why is the case fault? For whatever reason, you want to be able to draw so much current from the wall that you're going to break to just so, so the case isn't energized at 120 volts or more. And the second primary reason is to drain the present leakage currents uh, away from the device as well. A third, uh, it also can serve for some RF filtering, electromagnetic uh, interference, RF interference filtering uh, also can provide a return path for those currents. Remember these guys? Oh, George, his buddy Gustav Kirchhoff, he came up with two fundamental laws, relationships, um, that describe and define virtually everything we do electrically. And again, the cool thing about these is that they are laws. They're not opinions. They're not, they're not uh, you know, a popular thing that's going to change, you know, next month. They're not going anywhere. And they have it for hundreds of years. But they're just so incredibly and sick and elegant and their ability to basically describe, in this case, the interrelationship between voltage current and resistance uh, in, in circuits. And it describes a linear relationship between current voltage divided by resistance. So if we double the voltage, we're gonna double the current. It's a linear relationship, uh, very simple. And it just does what it does. We also, it also applies, the law works exactly the same way in AC circuits. And the only difference now primarily, instead of dealing with just pure resistance, your R's, we have to think now and describe these currents and voltages in terms of uh, impedance Z. And there's three forms that impedances can look like. We can have an uh, impedance Z look like a pure resistance, which is exactly what we do with incandescent bulbs, uh, baseboard heaters, coffee pots that are just purely heating elements. They just look like a resistance. They can look like a RC network, a resistor in series with a capacitor, or they can look like a resistor in series with a coil, with a duct, motors, solenoid valves, things like that. They look like that. Loudspeakers look like that. Again, all this is leading up to where we're trying to go. Okay? So another way of kind of thinking of impedance, you can kind of think of it as like a frequency dependent resistor. The amount of opposition resistance that these components will provide depends on the frequency of the signals that they're exposed to. So resistors, capacitors, inductors, um, the impedance will change if the frequency that we're driving those components changes. So again, it can look like a pure resistor, light bulbs, heaters, coffee pots, and Ohm's law again applies. Voltage divided by Z gives us current. Power over the voltage will give us current. And the key thing about those circuits is that the current and the voltages are in phase. 
So they're crossing zero together, they reach their peak at the zero, they go negative exactly in phase. That's crucial. For RL looking circuits, again, these can be loudspeakers, motors, solenoid valves. Uh, they have inductance, they have a coil of wire typically associated with them. There's resistance in that wire as well. So all of those circuits can ultimately be reduced to a simple RL circuit. And the key behavioral feature of RL circuits is that the current now lags the voltage. Fundamental behavior of coil, the, the current can't change instantaneously to a coil. Just can't happen. The older timers sometimes call them chokes because the current is kind of being choked off. It, it can't go, it can't change instantaneously, so it lags the voltage. And we can measure this, this amount of lag. And this is precisely what the done here coming up will see. The significance of it. Some of this coming back a little bit. Are you, are you puking yet? Is it bringing up old file? And, oh, I can't stay there. <laughs> some that happens with some people, depending on how you this stuff was taught. Our uh, one of our former physiology instructors at school, um, she got a PhD in physiology, but she graduated from the same program, and she can't stand that electrical stuff. So anytime I would measure, mention uh, Kirchhoff, a feminine equivalent, she just puts her hands to her ears and starts screaming. It's almost like she goes back to her you know, post-traumatic stress. <laughs> but anyway, some people just like that. You find our gearheads, mechanical guys. I don't know what that is. Um, and it, it goes vice versa too. The electrical, the electrical engineering students, they can't stand the ME stuff, statics, dynamics, blah, blah. and just the vice versa. The MEs can't stand the electrical stuff. I think it just comes down to our aptitudes and our the stuff we kind of feel most comfortable with, but it's just a weird like anyway. Another fundamental uh, component in all of this are capacitors, and fundamentally, uh, capacitors exist simply passive device. We don't have to put any energy in it to make it work, just two conductors separated by an insulator. We have a capacitor, whether it be we roll it up, uh, depending on how we make it, but fundamentally. Two conductors separated by an insulator that we call the dielectric. We have a capacitor. Okay. And that uh, capacitance uh, will fundamentally oppose this rapid changes in voltage. The voltage across a capacitor cannot change instantaneously. It's going to change at a predefined rate. Okay. The key thing is two conductors, insulated conductors, capacitor. Where we're going with this ultimately, just our line cords or any conductor, any wire line cord, there's capacitance between the hot, the neutral, the hot, and the ground. There's not a physical capacitance, but there is a, what we call them, parasitic capacitance. There's capacitance, measurable capacitance, anytime we have two conductors separated by insulin. And the behavior of capacitors, they oppose current, they have a a resistance associated to them that we call reactants, capacitive reactants, X of C. And the magnitude of that resistance is equal to one over two pi times the frequency times the capacity. In other words, it's inversely proportional to frequency. So as the frequency goes up, that resistance goes down. If you guys ever worked on the hypercators, we used to call them, they're like miniaturized, low power, Electrosurgical units. You see them in the dermatology offices. Dentists use them for gum surgery. They only got one wire. You know, they don't have a return electrode like we do with a surgical electrosurgical unit. And what they rely on is this very relationship. Just sitting in a conductive chair, even though it's insulated, um, there is capacitance, straight capacitance between your body and you. And it relies on that coupling. To provide a return path for the lower power electrosurgical current to the other. Here's where it comes in. The primary source, because of our leakage currents and all of our appliances, whether it be a cardiac monitor or your vacuum cleaner, is the presence of those parasitic capacitances. Okay, so, anything, you've got hot side, neutral, hot to ground. 
Again, there's no physical capacitors here, though, but just the sheer proximity of the conductors creates a capacitance through which, as dictated by Ohm's law, a current that will flow through the conductor. And we can measure these as our leakage currents. The currents flowing through that ground wire is due more often than not to those parasitic capacitances. Any of you guys remember this, these old line cords? I think they're still out there. Dale, I think, made them. Big hawk and blue things, about the size of your thumb. You guys remember those big motors? And um, one of the reasons they were so big is that they, the fillers in there were made out of tiny polypropylene, big polypropylene fillers in here, which did two things. Polypropylene had a lower dielectric uh, constant associated with it, and it physically separated the conductors more. And the capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance. So the farther the separation is, the lower the capacitance. This was bad. We still use this stuff. You guys see this anymore? Mostly, it was used so that we can have 16 foot cones in the bar because of that low heat. That where, I think that's where I kind of remember our electrical surgical units. Do you see that stuff anymore? Is this stuff still on? We use extension cords, so we have to have more of these cords to put all under. They have to put on the isolated test on the old version ones, you know, the endoscopic part. Yeah. That's not the leakage current. So we have that on the IPC transformer, everything plugged into it, and the system needs the leakage current. Just to get the leakage current going. Back in our crazy days, which we'll see, we were, we were just nuts over this stuff. Yeah. So this is where a lot of this stuff evolved as a result of our early days. This is fundamentally where it's kind of kind of coming from. What you'll often see that can contribute dramatically to uh, leakage currents are why input filters. You know, so if you ever measure leakage on a device it's like way over the limit or real close, really high, relatively high leakage currents, is because all likelihood there are RF filters at the input. And here, in, in these devices, there are physical, intentional capacitors between hot side of line ground neutral line. And they're in there for two primary reasons. The uh, AC line, if you ever had a chance to look at this, we have rented analyzers every now and then, real expensive analyzers to look, monitor our power. There is all kinds of shit flying on a normal AC line. I don't know if you ever looked at that. You know, you see our books all pretty clean signage. Oh. There's all kinds of garbage flying on it, really high speed honk and transients and just junk on our on our incoming power line. Well, that those filters are designed to filter some of that out, as well as prevent the device from injecting garbage back on the power line. So it kind of works both ways. But in RC circuits, which these all look like now, this case the current is leading the voltage. So we can now measure also that degree of phase shift as, as well. I, I remember when they first started putting those filters in the same computers back in the 285, because the Intel, they would put those that nice and kind of blue and big balls and girls and coins in with a with a microprocessor. Yep, it's exactly what it did. And because um again they're so high speed, they're so fast. Now, you, even you try to filter with a capacitor, remember the capacitive reactance just goes down with incoming frequency. So these things are so high speed that they just walk like DK. And of course, with all our digital stuff, you see a rising edge, a falling edge, that's a command, you know, to do something, turn on, you know, so then freak it all out for sure. So yeah, exactly what I was doing. Okay, just an example, if we had 10 nanofarads, nano is 10 to the minus 9, billions of a farad. Realistic, you need physical capacity. Where we have 10 nanofarads of stray or actual capacitance, let's say between the hot side and ground, we would, we would, it would produce about 452 microamps of leakage. The next thing you'll need, we'll get a real small capacitor, rigid voltage wave, but just stick it in between hot and neutral on your analyzers. And we can determine the reactants, 1 over 2 pi FC. It looks like about a 265 K ohm resistor. You divide that into 120 volts, you get about 452 microamps. You can even measure leakage. Next time, just get an unterminated line cord. Try that sometime if you haven't done it. Line cord. Just stick it in the analyzer. 
probably going to measure maybe five to ten micrometers of leakage here, just because of that to pass that strain capacity. Again, you know, just look inside your device. You got incoming power. You got, you know, you got even though you got things shrink wrapped, there's no limit induction. You know, you don't have to need a short or anything or a string strand of wire. Just the insulated conductor laying on top of a conductive case. You have a capacitance there, and it's through that capacitance that we can have measurable currents. That is where our leakage phenomenon. What we can also do, I just took a valley lab ESU that we had laying around, and we can measure the voltage, obviously 120, nominal 120 going in. We can measure the, the current, which, which is really just the voltage. Our analyzers are actually measuring the voltage uh, millivolts across a 1K old standardized load, essentially. At, I mean, it's a standard Amy load, but at 60 hertz, for all intents and practical purposes, it's a one cable resistor. And so we can look at that and get about 81 microamps, all RMS now. And what we can do from the scope, from the information off the scope, we can convert the phase shift, because the current's leading the voltage, we can convert that little increment of time to a degree, an angle. And then using some basic circuit theory, we can come up with an equivalent resistor capacitor equivalent. In other words, what does the ES, what does the safety analyzer see when you plug that ESU in and it sees an equivalent of about 155 K you know, 1.8 nanofarad capacity. As far as the analyzer is concerned, that's what it's seeing electrically. But again, we don't live in that world. This is academic A head stuff right here. But the, the theory, and you can do this in the lab, it, it's all verifiable, provable. And this is how we, the standard being the answer goes. You know, we've spent, I think, I even must have spent, it had to be at least five to seven, eight years. Sometimes back maybe in the early 80s, 70s, before the standards came out, we were chasing these little bastards all around. Our whole professional mindset was consumed with these. I mean, we were plotting this stuff out, tracking it, writing it all down, trending it, and graphing it. I called it we were doing a lot of mental masturbation kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Putting in spreadsheets and looking at all of that. You know, we didn't care if the defibrillator worked. You know, the ventilator didn't work. We just keep that leakage curve down. We had to do it. Anyway, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But there's there's some fundamental concepts of how the body reacts to electricity, and some of it's pretty basic common sense kind of stuff. First of all, there has to be a voltage present, and we have to be part of the circuit to complete a circuit before any current will flow, flow through us. Uh, it's the current that has the stimulating physiological effects, not the voltage as much, because you, you've got the static shocks, thousands of volts, and you don't die. But you get a startle reaction, but it's the current that does the stimulating effects. When we when we inject that bolus of energy into the chest of the defibrillator, um, it's really the current from those machines that is depolarizing the heart that's doing the work. But the, the physiological effects, excited we can stimulate excitable tissue, uh, resistive heating. If it gets too high, like it does with the electrocute of uh, prisoners, uh, their brains are well over 170 degrees for hours afterwards. It's like the old thing we used to do in the dorm room when cook a hot dog. You just stick two you know, pieces of wire in a hot dog, plug it in the wall, you know, heat up and cook it in seconds. And then we can, we can burn. When we um, stimulate tissue, this is what tasers. Do. I did a uh, I did a ton of expert witnessing work. I'm going to talk a little bit about it next session. But one of the cases I worked on was a young guy that got tased and he died. And there's been a, hundreds of deaths that have unexplained deaths. Thousands of hundreds of people get tased. Most of them don't die. Some do. In this particular case, this young uh, 20 some guy will die. And um, the way the tasers work, it sends out a pulse, five second, uh, a pulse train of about 20, about 20 hertz. 
and it puts the whole body in this massive state of tension. So you get this massive, massive muscle contraction. It hurts like a bitch. You know, and you just, you just simply fall on the ground and you can't do anything. Oftentimes, unfortunately, you'll still see the cops yelling at the victim, hands behind your back, hands behind your back. You cannot put your hands behind your back. It's physiologically impossible when you're tetanized to do anything. And they'll often interpret that as non-compliance and just keep blasting. And then that's the muscle stimulating effect. It's a weaponized muscle stimulator. You may have seen some of these old um, data, these old graphs. They're a little bit on the obsolete side, but one of the key things I want to get to is this threshold of perception here. It's actually uh, for men and women actually much lower than we see in men. The other key thing is there's a uh, let go threshold that is right around also much lower than this. It's right around seven to seven to nine, seven to ten milliamps, and this is the the threshold at which if you grab the conductors, you could not let it go. You know, not even Arnold Schwarzenegger. But you can't let go of that. So massive stimulation to form finger flexors, you, you can't let go. This is why our ground fault circuit interrupters are designed to trip right around five milliamps to be below that threshold. But uh, a key, key, key thing here is the threshold of perception. And this is all being so it's all, all related to where I'm trying to go with the leakage currents, but it's all related to this concept of the threshold of perception. And years I was trying to explain leakage currents, microamps to students, and they're looking at you like, where's Pluto? You know, it's like it was an abstract microamps, millions of an amp, made no, it had no sense. So I made this stimulator. This is a second generation here now. I said, put your fingers on here. And you can turn the knob, and when you just feel a tingle, that's your threshold of perception. When you just barely feel the tingle. The very first version I made on those, uh, I don't know, 2005 or six, I, I got invited to Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, medical engineering school in Chihuahua. And so I, I took the original version of this, which was literally a black box with a bunch of wires hanging off of it and a meter on it. And I purposely put it in my, my, my carry-on bag I just wanted to kind of mess with the TSA guys. I know it's kind of, I shouldn't have done it, but I just, I just want to see what they do. And of course, they you know, hit the fan. You know, they pull it out and they start kind of yelling at me. What is, what, what is it? What is it? It's a head no label on it. It's literally a black box with a, with a meter, wires coming off it. And I started to play, so we can take it apart if you want. Get your hands away from there. I thought, Jesus, it's not loaded with C4. I didn't say that, you know, but they got all the way down on me. I was kind of glad that they got excited about it. But anyway, I, I made another version of it. And the critical concept here is how this behaves is even though you put your fingers on there, even though you, we've got a current passing through there, let's just say right here, 176 microamps, you don't feel a thing. Why you don't feel anything is because that current is below the threshold of perception. The receptors in our fingers are essentially forms of uh, nervous tissue that the way neurons and nervous tissue respond, there is a voltage across the, the, the membrane. If you had any biology somewhere along the way, it's called the, the cell membrane potential. The inside of the cell is normally 60, 70 millivolts negative with respect to the outside. So the voltage, you can physically measure those special types of instruments and electrons. When a stimuli, stimulus comes along of sufficient magnitude, we can cause that cell to depolarize momentarily, flip polarity. So it'll transition up to about plus 20 or 30 millivolts, creating a spike, which is a nerve impulse. We call it an action potential. Anything below that threshold, right here, about minus 55, you don't feel. If that same thing will happen with uh, sound. If the, the, if the nature of the sound is so low, it, we, don't, we don't stimulate, we don't trigger that threshold, you won't hear anything. Vision, you won't see anything. Touch, you won't feel anything. But when we hit that threshold, and like a cell is like a cellular orgasm. That cell is going to instantly fire, and there is a damn thing you do about it. It, it. Until it recovers itself and comes back down. But that creates a pulse. And it's that when that cell fires, that's when you just perceive that signal. It's all related. 
So if we, we can actually measure this stuff. So a lot of a typical neuron, for example, you can kind of think of these cells as a kind of a transducer in a sense, in that we can it measures all kinds of stuff. It, it can detect light, forces, temperatures, electrical, all kind of chemical changes, and it encodes the magnitude of this stuff by not amplitude, because its amplitude is fixed at about 20, 30 millivolts, but it encodes it the intensity by frequency. Frequency. The faster these things fire, the more intense the stimulus. So if you're just lightly stepping on a tap, you know, pop, 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 it all, ultimately the brain is interpreting the intensity of that tap. So that's not too bad. On the other hand, if you're really hot and step on it, you punctured your skin, you know, then it only gives that hurts. You know, the brain then freaks out because now it's detecting magnitude uh, by the frequency of that firing of that. So, this is all related. Okay. What I also do with this with this box for, for freshman class we have, I, I have the, the students find their thresholds between the men and the women. And I don't know this for sure. And this is the kind of consistent magnitudes we typically see. A couple hundred microamps is a threshold of perception for men and women. What we always tend to see too, is the, the women have a much, this, these are two standard error bars in fault. So 95% of the thresholds that are plus or minus two standard deviations away. Okay, so it varies from two points. But the, the average is blue dot 241, 258 or so. And I've always saw the, the women, much less variability. And I don't know this for sure, but I'm strongly convinced she's got a lot more variability with the guys. I think it's all macho. I can't tell you, the guys are, I don't feel nothing. Yeah. Oh, hey, Shelly, yeah, 300, 500 mic ramps. But just, you know, they want to be the tough guys. So they, they just, we, girls follow the rules. They pay, they do what we tell them. Guys, but anyway, we kind of see that kind of stuff kind of consistent. But here's what we, we often give old Ralph here. Uh, unfortunately, this paper, almost gave birth to our profession. Quite literally, the first job I had was in 1975. The hospital hired me to start a department just because the Joint Commission was starting to get excited about this. We're out, been out there, we're killing everybody, electrocuting everybody. And it, it, it got it mobilized the whole, the whole profession, quite literally. 71, Scientific Journal of All Things, here to be Scientific Journal. It got its attention. But if you start looking into this more deeply, and um, Malcolm Ridgeway has got a great, great, uh, a really great detailed historical treatment of this whole thing in uh, the uh, uh, first uh, clinical engineering handbook. Really great article he did on that. And he identified first that actually it was a physician who you have to really blame. He's the physician guy that really started it all. Carl Walter in 68. He's the one that came out in 1200. And he was a really well-renowned dude, physician surgeon at uh, uh, Harvard, uh, yeah, Harvard, I think. And um, so he was on uh, some NFPA committees. I think the guy even developed a blood bank, blood bags. He, he was very involved in sterilizer development, I guess, too. So he he, he carried a lot of clout and a lot of weight. But ultimately, he even admitted when challenged on, where did you get 1,200? Well, I just said we got so many hospitals, I figured it'd be one shot per hospital. It just pulled it kind of out of this rear end of the air. And that became kind of the thing. And Ralph later on came up and grabbed that. And at the same time, if you remember Joe Noble, Dr. Noble, the uh, first president of PCRI, in 73, he came out blasting these guys, saying this is all bullshit. You know, I mean, this is just a bunch of smoke and mirrors and stuff. But it mobilized the community. And of course, the manufacturers were very influential in getting their stuff into the codes and the standards. And uh, this stuff is still living there today. In my first job, this is like 75, it was still a requirement, showing commission the requirement that every month we had to take conductive floor measurements in the OR. You remember they doing that? And when I started there, and this is because we're not even using flammable anesthetics. Did they could use the final line of stacks like 15, 20 years ago before that, but it was in the requirement every month. I had to go and do conductive floor testing. 
and I'm just a stupid monkey right out of school. In our maintenance department, the electricians, they've been doing it faithfully. They had binders full of conductive phone records. And I said, well, I'm going to be up there setting up a program, checking the equipment out. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> what have you dumb little bastard? You know, they good plan to get rid of it. And so I'm doing it for a couple of months. It takes you half a day. Because you have the big old meter, you're going around the floor, boom, boom, you have to take And after a couple of months, I thought, what in the, what am I doing? This stupid ass heck. So I just quit doing it. And I, I had other things to do, you know. And sure enough, about a year out, less than a year later, Joint Commission came in with the, the superior, with the administrator, my boss, comes out of my little hole in the basement. Oh, can we see your conductive floor records, please? <laughs> well, we used to do it, but we don't anymore. I was kind of fired. Boss called me up. Who the hell did you take? <laughs> what me up? I don't know. The dumbass test. It makes no sense. You know, eventually we got that crap taken off. It cost you a little bit of flesh. But anyway, the old, the old doctor did a lot to try to change this. It didn't work. Anyway, how this stuff all got started. This is the worst case scenario, how it all got started. And it was seemingly plausible at the time. That's what gave it, gave it some uh, concern. But the, the, the scenario was you got a patient in an electrically operated bed, all metal at the time, all you know, conductive railings, and a bad ground wire. Not at all uncommon either. So there's leakage current on the bed, available on the bed. In the bed, you have a, pace, a patient with an exterior Indwelling catheter for an external pacemaker, not at all unrealistic, connected to an ECG monitor. And in those older days, you may have literally connected right leg to the physical ground or electrically be very close to ground. So you've deliberately, intentionally grounded the patient with the old equipment. Nurse comes up to make an adjustment on the pacemaker, the, the pacing leads, leaning on the guardrail. Leakage current now from the bed lower than her threshold of perception, she can't even feel it, he can't even feel it, passes through the nurse, into the catheter wires, through the patient's heart, through the ground, he killed the patient. That's how we were doing it, supposedly. That's the worst case scenario. That's how it all uh, fundamentally got started. Have you ever seen the old electronic external pacemakers? They're almost like some of the multimeters. The leads are very well shielded. But you, you see nurses, they were wrapping the leads in rubber gloves and, and stuff. So that was the scenario. We also didn't know anything at the time. You know, 10 or 50 microamps by defibrillated dog heart. So we got to keep our leakage currents less than that. There were a lot, of, a lot of work going on at the time, but just still a lot of ignorance, just a lot of fear, height, and uh, it kind of got crazy. See, but there's fundamentally five things this is where we're getting to the juice now, the essence of all this. There's five things that have to happen before anybody's going to get a shock, before the patient's going to get a shock, before the user's going to get a shock. First of all, we have to have a conductive surface on the device that's capable of being energized from the inside. First thing you got to have. Okay? Conductive surface capable of being energized from the inside. Where are our conductive surfaces for many of our devices now? You really start looking at, in fact, many of you probably have trouble where to put your safety analyzer lead. You know, many of them, you couldn't know, give you a stud in the back just so you can do your test. But there's virtually no conductive uh, services capable of being energized on the inside or beds. First thing you gotta have. Second thing is that you have to have sufficient coupling. So we need, we, we need sufficient coupling, RC, in between the hot side of the line and that conductive surface. So if there's no if there's no coupling or if there's a very, very high impedance, leakage currents will be very, very low. And that's the second thing we have to have. Okay. So that leakage current again is determined by that RC equivalent impedance. Third thing we have to have for everybody's in good shot, effective ground wire. Open ground. If you've got an intact ground, it doesn't matter what the leakage current is, because the leakage current is going to take the lowest path to the ground. Uh, in the old days, uh, the, C, the uh, College of American Pathology's labs, they had a lot of requirements for leakage current testing and stuff like that, which if you try to unplug a piece of lab equipment that's stabilized, you know, you screw up everybody. So 
after a while, once I started to understand this, I just put redundant grounds on a lot of that semi-permanent equipment. It just didn't do the testing because it didn't make no sense. You had, you had a double and redundant grounds, everything was fine. That's the third thing. So verifying, ensuring that that integrity of that ground, that's still a, that's still a legitimate uh, thing to do. And one of the reasons why that ground layer is there from Kirchhoff's current law, if you remember some of that from way, 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 way back, when that current law basically says that the sum of the currents entering a node, which is A, equals the sum of the currents leaving. Fundamentally, it's like a splitter, a Y splitter. You, know, you got five gallons going in, you get five gallons going out. But from Kirchhoff's current law, the current divider rule, that we can derive from that, is the voltage stays the same on a circuit. It explains why a low resistance ground is protective against shocks. So, so, so if we have, in other words, if we have 500 microamps coming in, and we have 0.5 ohms in parallel with, I say, a thousand ohm person, which is a pretty low value, most of that current, 499 microamps, is going to flow through ground, sparing the person. That's why that low resistance ground is so valuable. Fourth thing we got to have is a reasonably low impedance connection between Joe Person or Joe Patient and the case. And then fifth, lastly, we need to have that person or patient also low, reasonably low impedance connections to the physical earth. So we have a complete path. Five things. And even if we have that, some of the earlier studies have shown that even if you have that kind of low impedance pathway, there's only about 10% or less of the current thing going in your arm, on your foot, is going to pass through the heart. And we did empirical studies on cadavers to, to, to show that. Five things. So you remember our logical AND gates? A plus B, A and B and C and D. That's kind of what you can think about it. Before we're going to get a shock, all five of these conditions, independent conditions, have to be present. All five. Does that make sense so far? The probabilities of any one of these probabilities are measures of chance, varies from zero to one. Zero positive probability, impossible. One absolutely certain. Flipping a coin, for example, that's a balanced coin, you got 50 50 chance of getting heads and tails. What we call a compound probability. If we do that same independent event twice, now the probability of getting, say, two heads is 0.5 times 0.5, or 0.25. So these probabilities multiply. Essentially, in doing so, they get smaller and smaller. The bottom line, what that means is that if we eliminate any single one of those, you drive any one of those events to zero, the whole probability of getting a shock goes to zero. So if you have a non-conductive case, you have intact grounds, you have no connection between, it ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So the bottom line of all this, clearly, 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 got to keep looking at the line cord, strain release, cord caps. You know, these things get chewed up, ground up all the time. So that, that has a change. You still have to do that. Uh, that's a good thing. Verifying ground cord resistance, also a good thing. You don't do it, but it's not a, it's an incredibly simple thing to do to check the outlet tension. It's not as important because the hospital grade receptacles don't give a triple part, but these things have uh, some supplemental spring steel in there on these almost like phosphor bronze kind of contacts. That's why it's so hard to plug in, so hard to remove because you, they're really pitches a snot out of the, the plug. So tension it tends to be pretty good. Other than that, I know you've got codes and stuff depending on where you're at, but frankly, it's up to us as a profession just to tell these people we're not doing this stuff anymore. And yeah, you might get fired. You might get reprimanded and bitched out. And who the hell are you? But you can't argue with the daddy boss. This is not opinion stuff. It's just the way this stuff behaves. But you know, the thing I kept doing is that you guys are spending just a, there's just a ton of time doing these things. You got thousands of devices in your facility, 
all of that time adds up. And the other thing, I just find it just, just an incredible insult to your abilities and your skills to doing this mindless cleanup. You've got so many better things, more important things to be doing than winning a when you could go out and be doing the big things. So um, I think it's like a sandwich. I feel like a sandwich swimming up the street, you know. <laughs> you know, going on bears or really standing on an action. But um, fundamentally, uh, unless we do it, it won't happen. Make some sense, kind of? Yeah. Okay, any, any questions?